Okay. So let's start thinking about that a little bit. All right. We already wrote down, remember, so now we need to think about the radial part of the function. Okay, so we need to think about, we need to write down a Hamiltonian that is. Go back to the last slide. Oh, uh, yeah, of course, of course. I just want to see if I missed anything. Okay, no. No, there's not much else on that slide. Right. So we need to think about what does the radial part of the wave function look like. Well, we're going to have a kinetic energy. All right, let me rewrite this. We're going to have a kinetic energy part that's just dependent on R. And we need to have a potential that's just dependent on R as well. All right. Well, we've already written down weeks ago what the potential energy of this system is and the kinetic energy. So we just have to go back and look at our equations a bit. And the, the potential is the easiest part of this problem because we can appeal to electrostatics. So the potential energy of this system is minus E squared over four pi epsilon naught R. Right? It's got a one over R potential, right? This is Coulomb's law, right? And this is just the attraction between two charges that are opposite. Right? Each, the proton, the electron, both have charge E. Right? That's the fundamental charge. It's just a number. So you get E squared, product of the two charges. One's positive and one's negative. So the net gives you a negative sign. And we have this 4 pi epsilon naught R denominator. All right? So it goes as 1 over R. And it's attractive. Right? It's always negative. Right? This is always less than 0. Right, as it should be, right? Because a positive and a negative charge always attract each other regardless of the distance. Okay, and then we need to think about the kinetic energy part of this equation. Well, we, again, we wrote down this really, really scary operator for kinetic energy in three dimensions. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's rewrite it. And then let's just do a little bit of analysis and see what the, the relevant parts that we need are. All right, so the kinetic energy for the hydrogen atom is minus h bar squared over 2 times the mass of the electron times this big nasty differential equation, 1 over r squared times the derivative with respect to r of r squared d by dr. plus 1 over r squared sine theta d by d theta of sine theta d by d theta plus 1 over r squared sine squared theta times the second derivative with respect to phi. Now, Right? So this is our big, this is just the same thing. I just want to remind you that this is the same thing as minus h bar squared over 2me times the second derivatives with respect to position and Cartesian coordinates. All right? So the reason why this thing looks so ugly is because we have to convert from Cartesian coordinates to spherical coordinates. Right? It's the same thing. This is in Cartesian. Right? So even though this looks really scary, it still has the same meaning. It's still the, the, the square of the momentum. Remember, momentum is mass times velocity. And so this is, this is uh, momentum squared. It's, the, velo it's um, the change in the position times the change in position, which is the second derivative. All right? And we can correlate. Again, we have a second derivative with respect to r here a second derivative with respect to theta, and a second derivative with respect to phi, we still have the same behavior in this equation. It's just that everything's a little funky because of the conversion between spherical coordinates and Cartesian coordinates and uh, the chain rule. All right, this is all just a function of the chain rule. So it looks a little ugly, but it has the same physical meaning. We've just transformed our coordinates into spherical ones. But we can do some simplifications here. 
because we're only dealing with the radial part of the problem, right? So if we look at this expression right here, this one right here, we just have angular components here, right? So this has something to do with the angular momentum. Remember, angular momentum is just angular kinetic energy. That's how we measure it. So this has something to do with L squared. Okay, so we already know how to solve the angular momentum part, so we can substitute in all of those angular momentum parts into this angular part right here, and then we only have to worry about the derivative with respect to R. We've already solved this problem for angular, for the angular when we just looked at the angular part. So this, this right here, in fact, is this whole part right here is L squared over 2i, which is L squared over 2me r squared. Okay, we've already solved, we already know what the wave functions and the eigenvalues and all the stuff for L squared are. We just put them on a separate page. And so this whole part of the operator, the energy, we already know the answer to. It's the angular part of the energy. And it's equal to the value of L squared time divided by the, the, rate, the distance squared times the mass of the electron. Okay, so we can substitute that into here, and then we don't have any of these ugly derivatives anymore. All right, we just have them for R, which are the ones that we really care about here in this problem. So when we do that substitution, All right, so what I'm going to do, first of all, let's, let me just write a couple things here. So we're going to sub in, sub, sub in L squared. Um, we're going to apply a wave function to our system, which is going to be a product of a function that's dependent on R, times our spherical harmonic, which is our wave function in terms of angle. So our wave function is going to be some function r of r times our spherical harmonics, beta and phi. OK, so this, this r sub r here is going to be the radial part of our wave function. Okay. And the nice thing about this is that the wave function has separable dependence on angle and r. So the things that only take derivatives in terms of r is only going to affect this function. And all of this angular part, r sub r doesn't even know anything about it because it doesn't have any dependence on the angles. So this, the spherical harmonic has to do with L squared, it solves the part of the Hamiltonian, it's the wave function for the part of the Hamiltonian dependent on angular momentum. And then we have a separable part, a separate part that's only a function of R that'll solve the rest of the equation. Okay, so our net equation, so the idea is, is that, the, the conceptual idea is, is that the Hamiltonian for the hydrogen atom has a radial part and an angular part that are separable. And the wave functions that satisfy this, which again are functions of all three coordinates, are separated into a radial part that's by itself and a function y, which is a function of the angles. Right, so we're separating the problem formally into two independent it problems that, are, that don't communicate to each other. And so the wave function, the solution of that wave function, is actually just a product of these two functions that satisfy this. All right, so let's, let's do a little bit of math. And then I'm just going to apply just a bit more algebra. I'm going to solve for 0. Right, and when we do that, we're going to get an equation that looks like this. We get 
minus h bar squared d by dr of r squared times the derivative of psi with respect to r plus l squared applied to psi plus 2me r squared times the potential, which I'm not going to write down explicitly, but it's the radial part, the Coulomb's law part, the 1 over r, minus the energy of the system, psi is equal to 0. Okay, so what I've done here is I've taken h psi is equal to e psi and then put everything on the left-hand side. All right, so h minus e times psi gives me 0. Okay, so what I need to do is find a set of wave functions that satisfy this rather complicated equation. Okay. But we can make some simplifications. Right? So this part, for instance, L squared only depends on the angles. Right? So the only part of psi that matters here is the spherical harmonic, the part that depends on the angles. And over here, this term only depends on R. So we only need to consider the radial part here. Okay, so I'll let you catch up in just a sec. So what we can do is we can, we can, we can apply our little substitution and simplify this out. We know what L squared psi gives us. We've already solved for that. It's H bar squared L, L plus one. We know what that gives us, and we can we know that the angular part's not going to be involved in this radial part of the derivative. So we can make some simplifications. Well, I'm basically just going to rewrite the equation. So what we end up getting here. minus h bar squared over 2 m e r squared times the derivative with respect to r of r squared times the derivative of the radial part of the function plus h bar squared l l plus 1 which again is just a number over 2 m e r squared minus uh, e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught r minus our energies. And this is all multiplied by uh, the radial function is equal to 0. Okay, so what I've done is I've gotten rid of all the angular part, right? There's no theta and phi in here anymore. The only place where, where, where the angular part gets evaluated is in the L squared term. But when you apply L squared to the wave function, you get the h bar squared L, L plus 1. So it's already written in there. So what does this mean? Okay, so what, what do we need? We need, our radial functions need to satisfy, right? What does this equation look like, right? So this kind of looks like, 1 over r squared times the derivative with respect to r of r squared times the derivative of r, big R. So when I take that derivative, I should get something that looks like let me just uh, let me change my notation here just a sec. I just want to do this is roughly equal to, so I'm getting rid of all the constants and stuff, it's equal to something that looks like 1 over r minus 1 over r squared times the function. Okay? So what this says is that roughly, again, we have to worry about chain rule and the product rule over here, but roughly 
what we're looking for are functions of r that when we take a second derivative of them, we get the function back times 1 over r minus 1 over r squared. So we need functions that satisfy this expression. And let me just compare this to the harmonic oscillator. Right, so what's the equivalent form for the harmonic oscillator? Well, the harmonic oscillator says that the derivative with respect to position of the wave function gives me back um, roughly, let me write roughly, x squared times the wave function. Right, so the harmonic oscillator, we were looking for functions that when you take the second derivative, you get the function back times x squared. Here, we need to find functions that when you take the second derivative, and there's a couple of other terms here, because of, here we have a product rule. We have to take the derivative of this times this plus the derivative of this times this. And so there's two terms over here. Now we get a function that once you take that second derivative, you get 1 over r minus 1 over r squared back. Okay, instead of x squared. So the harmonic oscillator, you get r squared back. But here we're getting 1 over r. Okay, so this is going to have a different form of, form of a function. The r is going, the radial part of the function is not going to look like a harmonic oscillator function because a harmonic oscillator function returns back x squared on the outside. But here we have this 1 over r minus 1 over r squared dependent. Right, so the functions are going to look a little different. But again, the, the, the formalism really isn't that much different. The idea is we're looking for a set of functions that when we take a second derivative of them, that we get the function back times some function of r. Right? So it turned, I'm not going to solve this problem just like I did for the harmonic oscillator. Right? I said, this is something that you can look up the results for. And we wrote down the wave function. You can do that here too. This has been solved. Right? So not surprisingly, the hydrogen atom is well understood. We know what those functions look like. And it, tur it turns out that you can solve this with regular differential equations. And it's beyond the scope of this course, and it's just going to take me too long to derive the answer. So we'll just appeal to the result. I don't want to get lost too much in the math. So the function that we get out is, is somewhat complicated, um, but we'll work through these, func these radial functions a little bit and look at the, the results. And I think you'll start to see the kind of, the, the structure of the electron and the hydrogen atom is very familiar to you. This doesn't really change that much of your system. So the results of this, So I'm going to say, so taking this equation here that I've circled, right, we're going to solve this, solve for r of r. All right, and what we find is that we get a set of functions, wave functions, just like we expect, which I'll call r. And remember this, the harmonics, the, the, the spherical harmonics, they had two quantum numbers, L and, or J as I called it initially, and M. All right? And the radial functions also have two quantum numbers. First, the first one is a new one called N. All right? And it also takes an L, the angular minimum quantum number. Now remember, it should. Right? The radial behavior of our electrons should depend on the total angular minimum of the system. Because the faster that, that electron is spinning, the more centripetal force you have, centrifugal force you have, pushing the electron away. So as L increases, the electron should stretch away from the proton. Right? So it should be a function of this L. Right? It obviously has to, we have to account for the centrifugal force. And in fact, the centrifugal force itself is right here. This is the centrifugal force. This is what we call the centrifugal barrier, right? As L increases, the energy of your rotation increases as the system starts to stretch further and further. All right, so we've accounted for that already. But it's fixed, right? L is fixed here. And so we don't have to, we don't have, it doesn't affect L so much, but the radial behavior of the electron depends on the angular momentum. 
So the angular momentum doesn't de depend on the radius, but the radius depends on the angular momentum. All right, so we're going to have a different function based on the angular momentum, as we should, right? The p orbitals look different than the s orbitals. We should expect them to look different. All right, and this n number, this is the new number we haven't seen before, n. n is called the principal quantum number. Okay, and n can be anything greater than 1. Okay? This number is the 1, the 2, like 1s, 2s, 3s, 3p. That, that number, the initial number in those orbitals, that's what n is, right? the principal quantum number. It tells you if you're in the n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3 levels, 3s, 3p, and so on. Right? So you've seen this number before in GenCap. And this is, of course, just a function of r, right? And it's got this really scary equation, uh, but we'll work, we'll work through them. And every time you ever need to work with these, wave, these radial equations, I'll give them to you. So you don't have to derive them yourself. But this is the general formula for them. So the first, there's a normalization constant that's dependent on the values of n and l. Two n times the fa n plus one factorial cubed to the one half power. We have another constant with a new a new number we haven't seen before. A naught. It's a constant. I'll let you know what that constant is in a second the L plus 3 halves power. We have an R to the L dependence. And the main part of the wave function is this E to the minus R over N A9. Is that supposed to be a 2? Yes, a 2. 2 over N. That's correct. 2? Is that L plus 3 halves? Yes, okay. L plus 3 halves. So the f I have one more thing. I'm going to write it down. We'll define it in just a second. There's one more part of this function, a special function called a Laguerre polynomial. I'll write that down in just a second. It takes in two variables. It's like the spherical harmonic. It takes in two numbers, n plus 1 and 2L plus 1. And the input of that function is... 2 times r, this is, sorry, let me write that, that 2 more explicitly, over n um, a naught. Okay, so I've written down a bunch of stuff here. So let's break this down a little bit. Okay, so n and l are numbers. So this whole thing is just a number. Okay. And then we have this other normalization coefficient, which goes to L to the 3 halves. So it's just dependent on the value of L. And it's number A0. And we see that A0 appear in three different places. Let's keep going. There's this R to the L dependence. And then there's this exponent. But it's different than the exponent in the harmonic oscillator. And the harmonic oscillator gives you a bell curve, e to the minus r squared. This is e to the minus r. So the hydrogenic orbitals actually go as e to the minus r, not e to the minus r squared, which is interesting. We'll have to look at that. And that a naught is in the denominator of the exponent here. And then we have these magical functions, which I will write down the name of them. They're polynomials. They're called the Laguerre polynomials. Right. And it's not important what they what they look like. Again, these are things that I'll give you. But the Laguerre polynomial is the input, right? The, the, the variable for this polynomial is r, something to do with distance. But again, r is being divided by this a naught number here, too. Okay, so let's think a little bit. I think this a naught is in particular very important because it shows up everywhere. What is a naught? 
Well, let's think about what the units of A0 might be. So this is just a normalization constant, so we'll ignore it for now. I think the most important place to look at A0 is in this exponent. So the wave function is, depends on e to the minus r. Okay? So the units of r are meters, their length. And the total units of an exponent must be unitless overall. Okay, so the, the length in the numerator has to be canceled out by something in the denominator. So n is just a number, so it doesn't have units. It's a quantum number, 1, 2, 3, 4. So a naught, it has to have some units that cancel out the units of length. So if r is units meters, that means a naught has to have units of meters as well. So a naught is some sort of length. And it has a very special name. Let me put it, we'll put it right up here. This is what's called the Bohr radius. We'll derive it next class, where it comes from. But it has a fixed value. A naught is exactly 5.291772. Times 10 to the 11 meters, minus 11 meters, sorry. 10 to the minus 11 meters. So if I were to simplify this, this is about minus, this is about 0.53 angstroms. Okay, so built into the hydrogen atom is this magical length scale, half an angstrom. Right? Everything is relative to this half an angstrom constant. Right? And so if we think about the wave function, right, when we square this, right, we're going to want to square this to calculate the probability of where the electron may be in radius, right? We're going to take the square of it. So the probability is de dependent on e to the minus 2r over a0. Right? So a0 tells you a little, if so if r is kind of on the same order as a0, then you have roughly e to the minus 1, give or take, Right? And that's kind of a good value, like an average value for e to the minus r. So radiuses, distances for the electron that are on the order of a naught are what I would call physical normal distances for the electron. The electron tends to exist, on average, on the order of the, bond, of the Bohr radius. That's what this says. So the fact that... Let's think about it this way. If you take two hydrogen atoms together, they're both in their 1s state, and you put them together to make molecular hydrogen, H2. How long is the bond length for H2? Well, it's about an angstrom. Right? So if you think about two atoms coming together and they share their electrons, they're exactly the same. The electrons are in the 1s ground state. And if I'm claiming that the average distance for that electron from a proton is about 0.5 angstroms. So if you take two spheres, if you will, that are on average radius, 0.5 angstroms, what will the total length of the system be? It would be two times it. And that would give you a bond length of about one angstrom. So the Bohr radius sets the length scale for chemistry. Right? The fact that the, 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 the average distance for the electron to the proton, the 1s orbital, will show this is A0. We're on the order of A0. This sets bond lengths. Bond lengths are going to be on the order of some factor of, you know, maybe factor 2, factor 3, or something like that of A0. So the question, of course, is where does A0 come from? All right, it's got a very specific number. Where does this number come from? And it's very odd because in my previous equation, right, if we could look at the Hamiltonian, I don't have anything that looks like A0 in my equation. Right, I've got massive electron, E squared, epsilon naught, pi, H bar. I have all these constants, but where the hell is A naught? Right, how do I get that A naught? Well, A naught is a combination of all these constants. See, the thing is, is that the, the length scale of the hydrogen atom, the electron in the hydrogen atom, is defined by the universal constants of the universe. The speed of light the permittivity of free space, the charge of the electron and the proton, the value of h bar, the mass, all of these numbers play a role in determining this length scale. So as we'll see, um, not today, but tomorrow, 
or sorry, on Thursday, that A0 is dependent on the value of all these constants. It's this magical combination of all the constants that we know and love, or, or fear, um, the fundamental constants of the universe. And when you combine them in the right way, you get this A0 value, and that's just a fixed number. Right? The only thing that will ever change, the thing that sets the length scale of chemistry is the speed of light. It's the mass of the electrons, the charge of the electrons, Planck's constant, the fixed constants. And so there's nothing we can do about this. This is defined exclusively by the status of our universe, the behavior of our universe. So this is a derived number. It's not a, it's not a fundamental constant, but it's derived from all the fundamental constants, as we'll see. Okay, and that's why hydro, that's why bond lengths are about an angstrom. That's why they're about 1.5 angstrom. Maybe some are a little longer than that, some are a little shorter. It's because the, the average distance between the electron and the proton is fixed by the nature of the universe to about half an angstrom. Okay? And that puts all your bond lengths at a roughly two times that. Okay, there's one more thing that we have to adjust. Is again, this is a function of two quantum numbers, N and L. This solving the radial problem sets a limit to what L can be. L is dependent on N. So let's kind of summarize the numbers that we have so far. So these are the hydrogenic hydrogenic quantum numbers. All right? Remember, quantum numbers are just labels. They just tell us what state we're in, what energy level our molecule is in, or our atom in this case. And hi every hydrogen, every electron, or sorry, every state for the electron and hydrogen atom can be labeled with four numbers. All right? The first one is the one from the radial part, N. This is the principal quantum number. Okay, and n can be any value starting from 1, any integer. Okay. So that's our big number. Again, what, what does n tell you? n tells you something about the distance. Right? As n increases, the distance of the electron gets further and further away from the proton. Right? So this is what I would call, this is what I would call a, a purely radial number. Right? It tells you something about the length of the orbit, if you will. Right? And then the next one we have is L, which is sometimes written L cursive. This is the orbital angular momentum, Qn. Right? And of course, this is this is the eigenvalue, the quantum number for L squared. But when we include the radial part, L can only take certain values. L can, of course, be 0, but it can't be anything greater than n. So n sets the maximum amount of angular momentum the system can have. This is good. What does this say? Well, let's say set n equals to 1. OK, so we're at, the, we're at n equals 1, right? Call that like the 1s orbital. Right? The only allowed value for L, oh sorry, it's got to be n minus 1. I apologize. n minus 1. So if n is 1, all right, so we're in the n equals 1 radial state, the ground radial state, the only allowed value of L is n minus 1 equals 0, L equals 0. What is n equals 1, L equals 0? That's the 1s orbital. Right? There's no 1p orbital. Right, that would be L equals 1, N equals 1. There's no such thing. Right, the first P orbital is the 2P. Right, and that makes sense. When N equals 2, L can be 0 or N minus 1, which is 1. So you can have a 2S orbital, which is L equals 0, and a 2P orbital, which is L equals 1. Okay, so N sets the maximum amount of angular momentum the electron can have. Right, that's the difference now. And, the, and of course, the difference is, is that L can be any value when the electron is free to rotate. But it's not free to rotate. 
it's stuck on a tether that has some potential energy. And if you spin this, you're going to get that centrifugal force that's going to want to stretch that tether, that R, and you can only put in so much energy into that tether as a function of the radius. Right? So L can only be a finite many values. This is the consequence. None of the other math changed. The only thing that's changed is that now L is limited by N. It can only, you can only spin it so fast at a certain radius. The next number is m sub l, which is sometimes called m sub curse of l. This is the what I call this is typically what's called the azimuthal angular momentum quantum number. Right? And this is the number that represents the projection of the angular minimum along the z-axis, right? the different orbits. And we know there are two L plus one of them. So M sub L let me, let, me, let me keep it consistent. M sub big L can be anywhere from minus L minus L plus one to L minus one to L. It's the two angular minimum quantum numbers. And then we're left with one more, which is m sub s. This is the spin. Quantum number. All right, and m sub s can only be two values, right? Because the spin of the electron is only plus or minus one half. Okay. Every electronic state of the hydrogen atom can be labeled by one of the with these a combination of these four. Okay. And in particular, it really is only the first three. The spin is only dependent on whether the electron is spinning this way or this way. That will have some consequences about if we want to put two electrons in the same state. We want to fill the orbitals of many electrons, but we don't have to worry about that here at the moment because there's only one electron. We don't have to worry about multiple electrons yet. So really the first three quantum numbers really de de determine what orbital your electron is in. All right, so let's do some examples. All right, and then uh, we'll, we'll look at these examples more carefully in just a second. So again, the 1s orbital is n equals 0 L equals zero, All right? Oh, sorry, N equals one, I apologize. All right? We're in the one S, we're in the one state, right? The ground radial state, no angular minimum, that's S. All right, 2P is going to be N equals two, L equals one, right? But there are three of them, right? Because M sub L can be three different values. Right, there are three of them, where m is either equal to plus or minus one or zero. All right, we'll look at these in just a second. Okay, and I, I'll just keep going. Right, we can just just do another one. Three d is n equals three, l equals two, and there are five of them. where m is equal to plus or minus 2, plus or minus 1, or 0. Okay, You've seen this math before. Right? I'm only just formalizing it. Now the question, of course, is why don't I just use 1s, 2p, 3d? Why, why is it, why does it that I need to use all these quantum numbers, right? Why do I need to make it this complicated? Well, things start, as we'll see, things start to get funky when you introduce multiple electrons. And I'm going to show you, in, within a week or so, a situation where the concept of saying that my electron is 3D actually has some ambiguity to it. Not all 3D electrons are created the same. Right? And we'll see that for the P's in particular. 
that when we include, when, when I just think of it this way, you'd be like, well, what's the difference? But why can't I just write 2p in a px, py, pz? That's great. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm not including something important. I'm not considering the spin. Remember, this, this electron has two sources of angular momentum. It has the orbital angular momentum and the p orbital. It's got angular momentum 1. It also has an additional 1 half from the spin that will add, right? Angular momenta add. So you have two forces act, two angular forces acting on this electron. And when you get to situations where you have many different choices of m, and you also have this spin, you can have multiple states that can be all called 2p or 3d. They all have that notation, but they have different energies because of the way that the spin adds to the orbital angular momentum. We'll look at this. Uh, hopefully, to, hopefully on Thursday. So these labels that you learn in intro chem, they work really well for the hydrogen atom. They're not too bad. But they become ambiguous very, very quickly when you get to large systems. All right, so it's really important to start thinking about things in terms of their angular, their quantum, their quantum numbers, because these are unambiguous. Assigning these numbers is unambiguous. It works 100% of the time. Right? But this concept of 2p and 3d, these turn out there could be different 3d orbitals that have different energy. So all of them look a little different in terms of energy. Would not call them all equivalent. In fact, that's the case with the p's. So we'll look at that more carefully. Right? I'm trying to get rid of this, trying to get away from this classical notation that we use in GenCam because it just doesn't work all the time. And we'll see that very quickly, even in hydrogen. Okay, so let's look at some wave functions today. We've got about 15 minutes. So what I want to do is I want to make a little table. Let's look at some combinations of quantum numbers, put our electron at some energy level. Again, I haven't told you what the energies are yet. We'll do that on Thursday. We'll talk about energy levels next class. Let's, let's plug in some numbers and, and think about what, what are the radial and the angular parts. What does the wave function look like? Let's just do that. All right, what do the wave functions look like for these different orbitals? All right, because we have a radial part now and an angular momentum part. Right, we, we saw the spherical harmonics. They got those natural shapes of spheres and bulbs and all the appearance we do. But how does the radial part affect them? Right, so we know their shapes. We, we know their shapes already. But the radial dependence is very interesting, I think. So I want to make a big fat table here. We're going to label our states n, l, and m sub l, our three quantum numbers. And then in the, in the other column, I'm going to write the wave function down. And we'll also plot it. So we have a psi of n, l, and m sub l, which is a function of r, theta, and phi. And then we'll just do a rough plot, a radial plot of the function. And well, we'll just do a plot. We'll, we'll, we'll do a couple of different plots for each one. I'm just going to put, I'm just going to put plot. All right, so let's start with the simplest one, the 1s orbital, 1, 0, 0. OK, remember that the, and remember that this wave function, just as a, just a reminder, it has a radial part, which is a function, and it's a spherical is harmonic. That supposed to be M subscript E next to L? It's M subscript L. Oh. It's a cursive L. And let me fix that so I'm not con I'm consistent. So that's that's so typically traditionally we write L as a little subscript L, but I've been using big L. So let me just use L, big L. It doesn't matter. It's just a nice label. L and M sub L. Thank you. And of course the We have a spherical harmonic part, which is the function of angle, and then a radial part. All right, remember that we looked at the spherical harmonic for the 1s orbital. It, it's a sphere. It doesn't have any angular dependence. The value is the same at all angles. So the wave function for the 1s orbital doesn't have any angular dependence at all. It's just a sphere. But it does have radial dependence. All right, so the wave function for this is 1 over pi, square root of pi, sorry, times 
times 1 over a naught to the 3 halves e to the minus r, make sure I get this right, r over a naught. Okay, notice that it only has dependence on r. There's no dependence on angle. Right? A function that's three-dimensional, that's only dependent on r and not dependent on angle, has spherical symmetry. So this function is a, looks like the same from all directions, right? No matter which latitude or longitude you are in this magical hydrogen sphere, it looks the same as you peer down the towards the proton. Right? So it only depends on r, not the orientation. So we know that if I plot this function in three dimensions, it's going to look like a spherical shell. But here's the problem with that depiction, is that a spherical shell has a defined radius. But this function is defined from r equals 0 to r equals infinity. So the, this 1s orbital isn't just a shell, but it's a shell that's spherically symmetric that decays off to infinity. It's very, very hard to draw that. Right, so when you look at the 1s orbitals, when you take pictures of them, right, what, is it, what, do you, what does the Gen Chem textbook say? Right? Gen Chem says that this orbital, let me just draw it really roughly. We have a little proton right here. That it's just a sphere. Right, it's just a sphere. Right, but what does a sphere have? A sphere has a defined radius, but the wave function is extended out to infinity. Okay, so these radial shells turns out. So when we take this picture, when people take this picture or make this image, they calculate the wave function at the average value of r. So when you draw this shell, when people draw these pictures of the 1s orbital, they're setting r to be a fixed value. They're setting r to be a naught. So when you set r to be a naught, this goes away. You have e to the minus 1, which is e. It's just a number. And so your wave function is just a big number. And so a three-dimensional number is just a sphere. OK, so this picture right here assumes a finite r, that the, that the electron is fixed at some distance r, which is the surface of this sphere. But the electron is delocalized to infinity. So in fact, it's a, it's, a, it's a spherically symmetric shell that extends out to infinity. And the amplitude of it gets smaller and smaller as you go away from the center. So if I were to actually plot this function as a function of r, right? what does it look like? Well, at e equals 0, it's got some value, because you get e to the 0 is 1. And it just decays off as r goes to infinity like this. So this is the psi 1s of r. All right, so the function, the wave function, right, so what, what the function looks like in three dimensions, again, is a spherical shell. But the shell extends out to infinity. Right, so the electron can technically be anywhere around the proton. And the further it gets away from the proton, the less likely it's there. But in general, it's going to be in a spherical shell that has infinite thickness. Asymptotically, there's a zero thickness, but asymptotically, it goes to infinity. Right? The 1s orbital is extended forever, but it's spherical. And that's what it actually is next So time. yeah, this, this, this picture right here is if I take if I draw a line from the center out to some point here on the sphere and extend it out forever, the wave, the, 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 the wave function as I go along this trajectory looks like this. Okay, I know it's kind of hard to imagine that. Again, this is, this is the problem, is that wave functions are actually four-dimensional, right? They have three coordinates and then they have a value. Right? So the function is a y equals a function of r, theta, and phi. So you need to have three dimensions to calculate the value, and then you need a fourth dimension to plot the result. So 
So wave functions are kind of hard to draw for the hydrogen atom because they're actually four-dimensional surfaces. They're three-dimensional surfaces, but you have to plot them in four because you need an axis for the y, the output. So it's very hard to draw this, but the idea is, is that the wave function is spherically symmetric, and as you walk across any line along the radial part, the wave function decays as 1 over e to the r. Sorry, e to the minus r. I guess it's the same thing. All right, it's very hard to imagine this, OK? This is why we draw these pictures like this. They're not accurate. But we have to reduce the dimensionality of our picture in order to plot it in three dimensions. So when you draw these pictures of orbitals, you fix r to some value and then plot the angular part of it. And typically, the 1s orbital is plotted so that r is fixed to the Bohr radius. r is equal to a0, and then it's just a sphere of radius a0. Very, very hard to draw these. So let's go to the next one. Let's go to the 2s. What happens in the 2s? Let's look at the 2, 0, 0. All right, it's got some numbers on the outside for normalization. 1 over 4 root 2 pi. 1 over a naught to the 3 halves. And then we have, um, let me just make sure I got it right. Yeah, so this is 2 minus r over a naught e to the minus r over 2 a naught. OK. So something's changed here. So again, we still have this e to the minus r behavior, right? So the wave function still decays like this. There's no angular part, so it's still spherically symmetric. But now this is multiplied by a linear function, 2 minus r. So this is going to change signs at some point. So this wave function is going to be positive for some values and then negative for other values. All right, so this one changes sign. And what happens when a wave function changes sign? You have a node. There's going to be a point, right? The point where the wave function crosses zero, where there's no probability. So instead of having a perfect sphere, we're going to have shells. We're going to have a positive value shell that's a sphere. And then there's going to be a boundary where there's no probability for the electron to be. And then there's going to be another spherically symmetric shell. Right? There's a node. And a node in one dimension, right? If the function crosses the dimension along r, crosses the x-axis along r, and changes sign, then that means that you're going to have a spherical region around your, your proton where the electron can't be. It's a nodal sphere. So that's a very hard thing to draw, but let's do our best. So let's go ahead, let me go ahead and plot what this function looks like with respect to r. Again, when r is 0, you get a positive number here. This is positive. So everything is positive. So this function starts out at some value here. And then it, it crosses 0 at some point. And then the decay starts to kick in. All right, so the function kind of looks like this. It's not the best drawing in the world. But the idea is, is, is correct, right? Um, the function is going to have an initial decay and decay, and then eventually go to zero like this. Right? And so there's a node in our wave function. Right? And so there's going to be a radius in this orbital where the electron can't exist. So if I plot this as a sphere, if I plot this in my three-dimensional plot as best I can, Let me put my little proton in the middle. Right, 
I'm going to have a region around the cert, around the proton that has some probability. And then there's going to be a boundary. Well, let me give it a color. There's going to be a boundary right on this surface, the edge of the surface, that's a node. We have a nodal surface. And then outside of that, there's going to be another sphere that extends off to infinity that's a different sign. And that extends off to infinity. Right, so, so this looks like two concentric spheres. with a connecting shell that is a node. Okay, so it's like a 1s orbital and then there's a, a infinitely thin region around that 1s orbital where the electron can't be and then there's another, there's a shell on the outside of that that extends to infinity that the electron can be in, okay? So the idea is that we're getting that wave-like behavior, right? As you excite the electron, or the electron's a wave, treat as a wave, it's starting to have nodes, right? Just like the harmonic oscillator does as we excite it, or any other system, right? So we get these concentric shells. All right, you can imagine the 3s orbital, you get two shells like that, right? The system changes in the 3s orbital, the, there are two nodes. And in a 4s orbital, there are three nodes. And in a 5s orbital, there are four nodes. And the 1s orbitals, the s orbitals, just again look like these spherical shells with these boundaries in between them as the, as the wave function changes sign that are infinitely thin, that the electron can't exist in. All right, it's a very hard thing to image, but again, the idea is that the s orbitals just kind of build off on each other. They just kind of embed each other on top of each other. And then there's this boundary between each of the shells that the electron can't exist in. Okay, so let me just finish up one more thing. Let's just look at a p orbital, and then we'll come back to this because I'm running out of time. We'll come back to this next class. Let's just do one of the p orbitals right now, and then we'll do the other two at the beginning of class on Thursday. Okay, so let's now do the 2, 1, 0. This is the 2pz orbital. This is the 2s. And this has function 1 over 4 square root of 2 pi, 1 over a naught to the 3 halves, but it's r over a naught e to the minus r over 2 a naught cosine theta. Odd. See, now we have some angular dependence on our wave function. Notice that we have, we still have this polynomial, right? We have a linear function. We have e to the minus r times the linear function, but this is r. So for all positive r, this has no notes. Right? The only note that this has is that r equals 0. Okay, so the only note for this is r equals 0, whereas this one has a node at some finite radius. So there's a node at the proton. And there's also this angular dependence, cosine theta. So where is, where is cosine theta largest? Well, where theta is either 0 or pi. So what are the directions for 0 or pi along theta? Well, theta equals 0 is positive z, and theta equals pi is negative z. So this is the z orbital, the, p, the z projection of the p orbital. It has magnitude along the z axis and none along the xy, right? Because theta is pi over 2 in the xy plane. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So this function, it's really hard to draw this in one dimension, or in two dimensions. So instead, what I'll do is I'll just draw it the normal way.
This function has a node at r equals zero and some magnitude along the z-axis. This is a 2bz orbital. All right, remember that this is this has a maximum, I'll just write this here, a maximum at theta equals 0 and pi, which is plus or minus z along the z-axis. So the z orbital has no dependence, no projection along the xy plane. In fact, this has a nodal plane, right? The entire xy plane is completely probability 0. Right, so I can even sketch that, right? Just kind of draw a couple of a parallelogram here. Just kind of draw it behind. Right, this whole plane that's drawn out by this parallelogram in the xy plane. is a nodal plane, all right? So in the PZ orbital, the electron cannot be, can only have XY coordinates of zero, all right? All of the, or sorry, sorry, I take that back. If Z is equal to zero, so if it's in the equator of the electron, or sorry, the equator of the atom, it can't, it can only be, oh, it can't be in the equator at all, actually. It has no probability on the equator. So the electron can only exist above and below the plane and along the z-axis. Okay, and so you get this PZ orbit. Not surprising, the other two, we're going to set them up so that the other one lies along the x and the other one lies along the y. Exact same behavior, it's just that the nodal plane will change to the other two directions. All right, so this, uh, this electron is polarized, as we say, along the z-axis. So if, this, uh, if the electron's in the 2p orbital and this atom comes along and wants to react with another electron, that electron's only going to interact along the z-axis. It's not going to interact with any electrons in the xy plane. It can't. It's orthogonal to that. That'll have some, compli that'll have some uh, con consequences in bonding. Okay? So that's what it is. So again, the, these are the orbitals you know and love. They haven't changed. They just have a slight, some slight... Um, what am, I t what am I trying to say? Some slight conditionality, right? So it's just slightly more complicated than you're used to in the sense that this orbital, again, extends out to infinity, right? The electron, as long as it's in this region, it can be anywhere in terms of distance. But that distance go levels off exponentially as a function of distance. Okay, so these, these are just pictures of where the electron is at a on average, okay? So next class, we'll come back to that, finish the other orbitals. And then we'll go calculate that. What is the average position of the electron in these orbitals? And then maybe we'll be able to justify these pictures a little bit better. Okay? We'll come back to that. All right, you guys have a good day. Right, I'm having a statue. Why? So, with buffers, do you keep it in moles? It's like right on the outside, but it's a bottle. Um, what type of facilities? Says, I uh, got chapter it, 19. I, I know there's some that use moles and I know there's some know. that uses molarity. I can never remember the difference in why I was allowed to do it. Chapter 19. I chapter 19. Because I feel like I'm having a stroke. I cannot remember. I feel like this way. Like, like, this is remember. just KSP. Even when you do ice charts for like, um, there's a time when you can use moles in an ice chart. When is that That's allowed? Good. Good drama. I know what you're <laughs> good drama. Good tea. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I just can't remember right now. And I feel like I'm dying. Have you looked through the, the if you start with we go over it, no, in the uh, if you're changing that to equivalent like that. Well, because like when you're doing ice charts with buffers, you do them in moles, right? When can but I can't remember why. You said that you still So like um like and uh, for example, still, when you're using like the Hasselbach like three credit and you're doing the negative the concentration, next, this one doesn't mold. Yeah, I should have some space for you. Okay. One is it moles and one is yeah. it um, Let me think molarity. about this. Like, so I have AI. Jimmy. No, but that's what everything was saying. Uh, Sabita. Who else was working with me? And here? if you do it in molarity, you, you get a negative. 
Yeah, I have room for you. Oh, so. We should talk about a project at some point. Um, yes. I feel like I'm having a yeah, stroke. I'm going to start right writing up whoever takes over my things. Yeah, you, you should have a meeting with me at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, can we meet next week, maybe? At some, can you come to my office it? hours, maybe, next sure, Tuesday? Yeah. Let's uh, just talk about it next Tuesday. Okay, okay next Tuesday? Yeah. Okay, now we'll, I remember we'll what you're We need to find about, a project, and, it and then um, I just there's can't a form remember when you're supposed to use when. Okay. okay. We'll just take care maybe of that. Maybe the slides will go ahead. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, maybe. Oh, you did too? Yeah. Can you come Wednesday? Wednesday? Wednesday, office hours? Next Wednesday. Next, sorry. Next Tuesday. Next Tuesday. Come to my office hours next Tuesday. I'll talk to both of you. Okay. I just wanted to make sure.